Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Yes, I, I do speak a little bit of French, but since I could not even give this in Swedish, I think I'll do it in English. Yes. Um, so. so, first of all, we're a fairly small audience here, and you know, it would be a miracle if I'm going to try. Close to this session. It would be a miracle if I can tell you exactly what you want to hear. So please ask questions. My view of this is you're not as unique as you think. If you're wondering something, I'm sure somebody else is wondering that too. So it's not only for yourself. So yeah, so this was a long time ago. So, and um, I'm going to tell you some things about small depth circuits. Um, this was my PhD thesis a long time ago, uh, and then I sort of gave up, but then somehow, you know, we got back and solved some of the old problems that we couldn't solve then recently, and uh, somehow this word switching lemma, if you don't know what the switching lemma is, I will explain it, well, half into the talk, but I'll give some more review of the results, and then we'll talk about switching lemmas and, and, and things. But uh, please do ask questions. Uh, and one of the things that I like about, you know, I, I, just to be more distinguished by the way I put on a jacket today, which I don't normally work, do, but I thought the French are so formal, so we should have a jacket here. Um, and, but also you don't have to be fair to anybody, so, well you should, but I'm not. Uh, and I'll just focus, you know, on a line of results that I like. So you, you would, um, if you feel that, you know, you should have mentioned this person, I will, will mention some people, then uh, Ask you know wasn't his work or her work relevant and I said yeah but I somehow did. So where are we today? You know we'll mostly be dealing with small depth circuits. Uh, we have AND gates and OR gates, and uh, we have uh, you know it's easy to see that uh, we have alternating levels of AND gates and OR gates, and uh, because if you have an AND gate feeding it to a different AND gate, you can sort of short circuit it and send it directly up to the higher AND gate. And if, and if you have something going two layers, you can add some dummy nodes on, on the way, so it doesn't really matter. So, but we have wires going from uh, one layer to the next. Uh, the number of Boolean variables will be usually be L, and the depth will be D, so this is 3 in this case, and the size will usually be capital S, so this is size 12. So this is just a random circuit I constructed, I have no idea what it computes. Are you happy with the model? Any questions? Well, the size is the num number of gates. Yes, you know, if you're very particular, you can ask, do you ask the number of gates or wires? So such things, they're within a square, they're, they're about the same, right? And such small factors as squares, we won't be too worried about in this, in this talk, yeah. But if you're not gates, not gates are allowed. Yeah, so this is we only have negations at the bottom here. And if you had internal not gates, by doubling the size of the circuit, you can push them through. So yeah, so negations will only appear at the bottom, but that's uh, within a factor of two, not. Uh, and why look at these absurd creatures? Well, I think they're interesting on their own. And uh, when we started this in the 1980s, we said, well, this is the simplest circuit class, and once we prove lower bounds for this, you know, we're going to have higher depth, and then we're going to do MC1, and then we're going to do MP versus P, and then we're going to do everything. And uh, yeah, we got a few steps on that road, but we didn't get as far as we thought we would in those good old days. But also if you're into relativized circuit, I don't know if you know relativized complexity classes, but lower bounds for constant depth circuits is sort of the, the meat of proving a result like, you know, that uh, uh, the polynomial time hierarchy is not included in p-space or separating the def different levels within the polynomial time hierarchy. That's, but I won't touch on this. If you know what this, you do, and if you don't know, it doesn't really matter. So what did we do in the 80s? Well, we, uh, basically two things as I view it. We were trying to prove that explicit functions are hard to compute in, in you know, very small depth. And somehow you would think that the harder the function you need to compute, the easier it is to prove a lower bound. But somehow experience shows that this is not the case. 
it's easier to prove lower bounds for something that's just a little bit more difficult than the thing you're trying to prove. So parity is not a complicated function, but it's a very nice function that we understand extremely well. So that's traditional. We were proving lower bounds for parity, and you'll see why. And the other thing we were trying to prove is to say that you know depth d and depth d plus one are very different. There are functions that are have really read ones, linear size circuits, and depth d. But if you decrease the depth, you in fact need a much bigger circuit. So these were the two classical questions. Um, uh, so let's start at the beginning. So now these depth one is not interesting. Right? So that's just an AND gate or an OR gate. So this is not interesting. So we'll have depth two is the first interesting case. And somehow I said this is easy to understand. Uh, with a question mark, uh, because if I give you such a circuit, you know, saying does this compute the identically one function or the identically zero function, depending if you're an AND gate or OR gate at the top, is actually an empty hard problem, right? That's satisfiability. So they're a little bit complicated to understand. And you know, if you're asking more subtle question about these, uh, but if you ask about the computability of simple functions, then um, they're sort of fairly easy to understand. And I just want to point out that if uh, one of these things compute f, then you can negate everything, propagate the negation through, and you get the computation of the negation of f. So if you have an and of ors or an or of ands, it doesn't matter too much. How many people know how to compute parity in this model? That's two circuits. Somebody should know. You know, I'm looking. Exponential uh, circuit. Yes, but how, of course we can observe we can compute any function. This is a universal model of comp computation, right? Yeah. So now, if you want to compute parity, how big a circuit do you need in depth two? You think about it for a while, you know. Then... Who is nodding? Is anybody uh, here? At least maybe two to the n. Yeah, so 2 to the n minus 1, in fact, because, yeah, if you're really, really careful. But that's the only way to do it, you know. If, you, if you're looking, if you want to compute parity by this, sorry. No, I haven't. No. So if you want to compute parity, say, in this model, we know that as soon as uh, one of these ors turn, turn into a zero, then the output will be a zero. So it's easy to see that you need fan in n here at the bottom because otherwise you can't compute parity. So then one of these OR gates is zero for exactly one input and then you have two to the n minus one OR gates and that's sort of, it's very easy to understand. Uh, but what if you, so this is upper and lower. This is not the question of, you know, roughly this, but this, you have one output gate and those many gates next to the input. So let's compute parity in depth 4. So maybe I put uh, too much information on this slide. So the way to think about this is that you want to compute the parity. You can, if you had parity gates, it would be easy. Because then you could sort of have a parity tree. And, but let's do it of depth 2 and find out square root n. And then you'll in, in fact replace each depth 2 circuit <coughs> with what we just did. Let me do this in pictures. I don't know if you can see this, but there are little pluses in here, right? So we're computing the parity of nine variables. So the, you can divide this into groups of three and then compute the parities of these groups of three and then take the parities of the results. And now you can replace each of these parities by you know, a depth two circuit, which would be of size four in this case, but this is you know, two to the square root n, really, in the way to think about it. And then you'll replace the bottom parents, OK? Did you get this? So you have a fan in 2 of square root n. You get size 2 to the square root n for these things. And then you get the depth 4 circuit. Everybody is happy with this? So I was ignoring, I was cheating you, and sort of the negations give you a factor of 2 here. But as you notice, I didn't really put the ands of ors and the ors of ands here. 
And if they, there's a choice, right? I told you that parities are both ors of ands and ands of ors. So if you use ands of ors here and ors of ands here, you in fact get two levels of ors next to each other which you can collapse and you make this into a depth three circuit. You're happy with this? So if you're high in depth, you can sort of take a parity tree of depth t, you have a fan up which is n to the 1 over t, and now you replace each parity gate by either an and of ors or an or of ands, <coughs> but you do this in a clever way so that you have the one on the even levels and the others on the odd levels, and then you always have two levels next to each other that you can collapse. So instead of getting depth 2d, you get depth d plus 1. And you will get something that's only exponentially in, in 1 over d here. Okay? You're happy? This was the upper bound. This is an upper bound. Yes, 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 yes. So the upper bound, you know, an upper bound as you said, this is, you know, you get 2 to the n to the 1 over d minus 1. Now I change d to d minus 1. And it's funny when you look in the literature, if you get the bound like this, and you design an algorithm with this running time, you say it's sub exponential. If you get a lower bound, you say it's exponential. And sort of, you always want to sell your results a little bit better. I think of this as sub exponential if I'm going to say it again during the talk. But it's funny when you read papers, you know, we think that scientists are precise and don't oversell their results, but you know, you tailor your, your words to make it sound a little bit better. Yeah. So, uh, but let's, the, the lower bound in fact proves that this is correct. So this was a series of papers that was in my thesis, and for which I got the first girl prize that Michelle was mentioning, that up to constant this is the right thing, and of course the constant is in the exponent here, as you know, it's, so you're within a power of 10 of the size, so it doesn't matter if you count gates or uh, wires, and uh, by a similar method, we could sort of prove that uh, we had the next things that in depth that were really read once in depth d, but also required a similar bound for in depth d minus one. These were sort of the two classical results in the You're happy with this? And then we sort of felt we were happy. You know, we were done with depth d circuit, then we should move to, to the different classes. Uh, but something when you really go back, you sort of say, well, we really want average case results. So if you're computing some function, and you say, well, you can't compute it exactly, but if you can compute it for 99.9% .9 of the inputs, you sort of can compute it. So it's really a question, you know, how well can we compute them? And the real hardness we want here is that since these output bits, we want that the, for any circuit, any function, this is a circuit in the class, it agrees with the function we're aiming at with roughly half the inputs. You know, and, and really half plus little over one. Half, we can never beat a half, right? Either the constant zero or the constant one always computes the function with probability half, so the best thing we could possibly hope for is half. So what did we get there in the good old days? Uh, so apparently we were actually getting pretty good results. So this this sort of the size thing with that appears sort of appears in the in the advantage. So it, it's sort of exponentially small or sub exponentially small if you're going to put it that. Way. Um, and this, as soon as you could prove that it couldn't compute exactly, you couldn't compute it really at all. Uh, what do you mean of same size? Uh, and so so same size so. So here I have a non-non exponent. So if you decrease it a little bit further from a tenth to a twentieth, so that's what I mean by the same size up to exponent, which is the square root. If you're, if you're really looking into details, it's the square root size. But it's the same kind of expression. No, but thanks very much. It's, it's good that you asked this question. That's good. Uh, but if you had polynomial size circuits, you know, we, we didn't get really any better result. We got a little bit better, but not much. And for this uh, hierarchy result, it was, it was horrible. 
So there, in fact, we were proving lower bounds for almost constant functions. For any function that we could prove a lower bound, it was the case that either it was one with overwhelming probability, it was zero with overwhelming probability. So it was really the approximation results were hopeless. And then I'm trying to look back down 30 years in my mind, so, so what were we thinking about these average case results? Well, I don't know if you know Aitai, but Aitai wrote a couple of very good papers, you know, very strong papers. We had as tiny, as from my point of view, flowing them, they were very hard to read, okay? You could read the results, but sort of getting through the proofs was a challenge, which I never <laughs> completely <laughs> was up to. So, but you could read his result, and in fact, if you looked at polynomial side circuit, he was getting much better correlation bounds than we were, were able to prove by, by our bounds. So this was fishy. Uh, and for hierarchy functions, I don't really remember what I, I thought would be true, but I, I can look back and, and look in my thesis and say, well, no, it would be nice to get some average case lower bounds. And whether I thought this would be possible or not, I'm not sure. And uh, one application that would you get by such lower bounds would be that at the polynomial time hierarchy was, you know, infinite relative to a random oracle, if you know what this means. This is sort of a nice application. So then, you know, a couple of, well, five years ago, which is fairly recent, but not, but the, uh, at least compared to that thing, we could actually get really stronger lower bounds. And the correct expression is not the power of n, but you could really get n over the uh, power of the log of the size of the circuit for the correlation. And the reason I put two references to myself there is that there's a journal version and a conference version. So the conference version was really independent, what obtained independently by Impagliazzo, Matthews, and Paturi in, in 2012. And then I bothered to make a journal versions, which they did not. So that seems like they were earlier, but we were in fact at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also here it's sort of funny, I want, I want to convince you about the algorithmic result, you know, the lower bounds are always a little bit difficult, so let me t t tell you how to approximate parity a little bit. Uh, so we have sort of a budget of size S that we want to compute parity. This is getting a bit too warm. So what you do is that in size s and depth t, you can compute the parity of log s to the d minus 1 variables. That's exactly what we know from, from, from the previous result, right? So we divide our, our big group into parities of this size, and then we compute the parity of each of these. And then we just take the and or the or of the result, whichever is more convenient. And if we take the or, then in fact, if the parity of each of the, the groups is zero, then the or is zero, and we're actually correct, well, in all the other cases, we're sort of 50-50. So we get a tiny advantage over parity. And, but that's all the advantage you can get. That's what the theorem says. And then it, it turns out also that a couple of years later, uh, Rossmann, Servetio, and Tang knocked off the, also the average case complexity for the, the hierarchy result. And they could only do it up to the size of that <laughs> square root of log n. And here I had to get back into the game for two reasons. I wanted to understand the result, which is also very difficult to read. You know, this desire not to read papers sort of is a good, good reason for making new research. It's much more fun to prove new theorems than to read other people's theorems. And I also was m managed to get this up to the right depth, which is log n over log log n. That's sort of the depth where these methods stop. Uh, so what I had thought I want to tell you a little bit about is, you know, why couldn't we knock these problems off 30 years ago? You know, it seems looking back that yeah, you know, we, we had these ideas in book in those days. Did you know, the young people get more intelligent or, or, or what, uh, what, what happened? So I want to tell you a little bit about this. Yes? Is, is there a relationship between uh, the average case and the uh, worst case lower bounds? This is, of course, a, a good question, right? So if something is, if you sort of have an, 
it depends what the average case is a little bit. So if, if you sort of have a randomized circuits that's correct for, with a high probability for each input, you can amplify these things by taking the majority of things. But here we have a little bit of problems because we can't compute majority in, in constant depth circuits. This is known because this is harder than parity. So in these low classes, it's sort of, they are rather different. Yes? But when you mean average, you mean uh, actually the uniform distribution. Good, that's an excellent, yeah. Yeah, so I, I mean, yes. Uh, this is re this is all. If you have some strange distribution of inputs, the game changes. This is really for uniformly random. I should have said this. Thank you. Yeah. No. More questions. I like questions. Good. That means you're still paying a little bit of attention. It's, you know, talking for an hour with slides. It's you know, if half the audience is not asleep by the end, you sort of did well. That's fortunately the way it is. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit, how do we actually prove lower bounds, you know, why, what methods were used, what did we need, okay? So looking at it broadly, there are two ways to prove lower bounds for small depth circuits, okay? One is restrictions, and that is a very simple thing. You fix the values to m many inputs of, of, your, of your circuit and see what happens. And this was sort of pioneered by Mike Sipser in the early 80s, like 82, 83. <coughs> And the other one is sort of used by polynomials, and that sort of said whatever is computed by a small depth circuit is sort of well approximated by a low degree polynomial. And that's what pioneered by Russ Borov. And I won't say anything more about this. We're going to do all restrictions and, 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 and here. Oh, I had it, it was 83, obviously. Um, so it's a very simple idea. The most simple restriction is called RP. It sort of, for each variable, it sort of keeps it with probability p, that's the parameter p, and otherwise it uniformly or randomly gives it a 0 or a 1, with equal probabilities. And you should think of p here as a very small number, you know, it's either a very small constant or some negative power of log, so maybe even a negative power of m, the number of inputs, depending on the situation. And I'm not even sure I'm going to just use this, maybe we'll get into this. So the, the the notation for this that SIPs are introduced is that, you know, something is mapped into 0, 1, or star, and star means that it remains a variable, that sort of... And now, finally, we get to the title of the talk. What do restrictions do? So, in my view, this, the, what uh, restrictions do is they, 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 there's a switching lemma that's sort of at the center of things. And the other thing, of course, they simplify all functions. And the key property that we want of parity is doesn't simplify parity too much. If you do a restriction, what remains is the parity of the remaining variables, or possibly the negation of the parity of the remaining. It, that's, parity is very insensitive to restrictions. So now we have the switching lemma, and if you're not going to remember anything else, maybe you should at least remember the statement of the switching lemma. So we know that any function can be written as an AND of OR or as an OR of AND. Okay? But what can be small in one representation can, can, might, might need to be extremely large in the other representation. It's easy to see that in general there's an exponential blow up when you go from one side to the other. But what the switching lemma tells you, that if you, at the same time as you're trying to do the switch, set most of the variables, then in fact it's very le likely that it can remain small. So the exact statement is, you start with something with bottom finding t, so it's not too big, and you want to convert it to the other type with bottom finding s, this is the failure probability, this is 5 times p times t to the s. So with overwhelming probability, provided that p is sort of smaller than 1 over the fanning in the thing on top, you can actually do the conversion. You're happy with this? So the, there's a switch between OR and so that's a switch. Yeah, that's the same thing. You switch from an, an OR of ANDs to an AND of OR and the other way around. Which is a very convenient thing to do. And there are less variables. Yeah, there's, so there are going to be less variables down here because you only keep yeah. sort of a fraction of P. But still, it's sort of it's magic that it sort of works. Yeah. 
Um, well, I, well, we can go back to the formulas. Let's see how, the, how this proves lower bounds for parity, okay? So we have some circuit here of, of depth 3, and it will have a small bottom <coughs> fan, and how that can be achieved, we can discuss if, if you want to. That can be done by having a very mild restriction at first. So let's see what happens if we hit this thing with a random restriction. Okay. For a suitable parameter, we'll not worry about the parameter for the time. Well, what, what's, what does the, the switching lemma tell you? It tells you that you have a depth two circuit like this guy. It will be possible to convert it to the other types of ands and ors from an or of ands. And similarly for the three sub-circuits there. They do share things at the third level, but this doesn't matter, you know. We, this doesn't matter at all for the proof. It could be disjointed, it could be the same. So the point is that once you do this, you can switch all the depth two circuits to the other type and maintain a small bottom fanning, which is now S. It goes from T to S with these parameters related by the switching. So this is just the same circuit as I had on the previous slide that copied, okay? But now we can make shortcuts that we've sort of been discussing all along, right? Now we have two adjacent levels of ends, so you can take these bottom gates and make them directly feed into the output gate, and that computes the same function. And that's sort of the, the, the procedure to prove lower bounds for parity. So, and in fact, I should have had this slide in the other order. You just, it turns out that the, the thing to get the bounds you want is that you set S and T to a negative power of, of N. We use a P that's sort of make conveniently P times T equal to a tenth, and then it just all works out. You know, it, there's nothing really hidden here. You have the circuit, you just work. And you remove one layer at a time, and, and you do induction, and it's nothing. Re the rest is just you know doing calculations and saying the words. You're happy with this proof? Any questions? So you know you you have your if this is depth four, you know you would apply to the bottom two levels. You switch the bottom two levels. You get two adjacent levels of the same type, and you collapse it to depth three, and then you do induction. Uh, but if you look at this average case, you know, how does this work? Well, you have some circuit depth T, you take an RP with the correct parameter, it sort of wipes out one level with high probability. And after done this d minus one times, you get a very simple circuit that has no correlation at all with parity. This is also easy to check. And this is true with high probability. So, and this is, but doing RP and then sort of completing the things with more random bits produces a completely random input. So this says that the average, the, the correlation we get is sort of bounded with one minus what, you know, with the failure probabilities in these two steps. And now you just have to get into what is the possibly the best p p p p failure probability we can get at each step. And it turns out that there is nothing you can do. The parameters I, I picked are the only way to pick parameters. You need something to, to remain, so if you're going to take d minus 1 things, you can't make p smaller than this. Because if, if p is smaller than this, nothing remains after d minus 1 things. And S has to be smaller than 1 over P, because otherwise the mean lemma or S is equal to T, so the, the statement is hopeless. And the fact the switching lemma is sharp, you know. The error bounds are what they look, it's a very simple examples. And so there's nothing you could do. So what's seen, as I said before, you know, if you, if you want to do something better, you have to really look at Eitan's paper, but that was not, I didn't have the energy of it then, when I was more energetic than I am now, and it is very hard to read. And then the problem was for 30 years, and then we were at some workshop in Dagstuhl, and somebody said, ah, we were trying to prove a little bit better lower bounds, and we got some very strange expression. And then I started thinking about it and said, yeah, maybe you can do something. So you can't avoid, you know, having some sub-circuits that don't switch. 
But what, if you look at it more closely, this is a very local problem. It's just one stupid circuit there that sort of happens to have one big AND. So what do you do? You, well, you give variables, values to those variables that sort of turn up during your proof. And you just prove the stronger switching lemma that you can't switch, but you can almost switch. And when you fail to switch, you just add a few val values to a few more variables. So formally, if you have lots of small depth circuits, these are all the sub-circuits, you can make a whole switch with essentially the usual mm -hmm. probability if you give values to some extra variable, to some uh, additional variable sets u. And the failure probability is of the same kind. You get the 24 instead of 5, but this is, doesn't matter since we're not so much into the constants anymore. And once you have this lemma, the rest of the proof just works. There's no, nothing that... And what I, this is sort of all I wanted to say about parity. And I, the, you should never give up. At some point you feel, now I've exhausted all my ideas about this problem and I can't do anything. And it's sort of amazing you go back 20 years later and say, well, you should change this and it actually works. And if you ever need a switching lemma, you know, there are lots of ways that you can twiddle with it and you'll get a slightly stronger result. Yeah. Okay, I'm going a little bit slow here, but we'll see. So, um, enough about parity. Any questions about parity in the lower bounds? And the, or, you're happy? Yeah. So, now the things will get more and more difficult, okay? So, what was so simple in the parity case is that we didn't really have to, to worry at all about parity, you know. We were fixing variables, parity is parity is parity is parity, and there's nothing bad going on there. Uh, sorry. But when, when we have the hierarchy results, we have two functions. One function is this defining function, you know, the function we want to prove is hard to compute, and it's actually not so hard to compute, it's computable by a depth D circuit. And now we have this competing circuit of depth d minus 1, but it's exponentially or sub-exponentially large, right? And we want to compute that that can't compute the same thing. So now if you just sort of mindlessly try restricting variables, we're very likely to kill this small but slightly deeper circuit. And in particular, if you use RP, you know, then we're going to kill the small circuit. This is known. This we know by the switching that lemma, which ex very high probability we're going to wipe out the small circuit. And we're going to sort of simplify also the slightly bigger circuit, but, but not to the extent that we need. So we can't, we cannot use our piece here. If we're ever going to do an average case result, we sort of we're going to do restrictions, 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 and then we sort of want to end up with a uniformly random input because that's the only thing we're talking about. How are we possibly going to do that if we're not going to use RP restrictions? So this key result here is let's look at this interesting way to 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 find define the restriction on a single AND gate. Okay. So let's do it by three. First, I pick a, a uniformly random non-empty set. So it's going to be non-empty, but otherwise uniformly random. And then I'll set all the things in the. I'll replace all the variables in this picked set by a new variable y. <coughs> and then I'll fix all the values outside this set to be y. Okay. So what's interesting here is that what the, this efficiently means that you know the, the output of the circuit is going to be y, okay? And if we later put put y equal to one with the right probability, which turned out to be two minus two to the minus m, we're actually getting a uniformly random input to this gate. It's a very funny sort of way, you know. We have we have m bits that we want to pick uniformly at random. And what I first say is that this subset of bits, they're going to be equal, but I won't tell you their values at this point. 
the other ones are going to be one, but these will all be equal. And then if I later say that there were, in fact, these, all these equal bits were equal to one or, or zero with the right probability, I in fact get a uniformly random input to the circuit. You're happy with this? It's a very fishy way of sort of setting things. That we promise that some things will be equal, we set some things randomly, and then we're going to fulfill this promise, but we're, not, we're going to delay this process of, of, of setting these bits. Uh, and this is called sort of called projections. This is uh, Rossmann, Servedio, and Tan was sort of using this. So we identify several original variables with the new variables. We set some things to constants, and then we sort of see what happens. And well, let's. It turns out. Let me skip. It, you want your inputs to be biased. You don't want them to be zero one. But this is sort of easy to fix by introducing you know the end of m variables as a new variable. And now you do just what, you, what you're, you're supposed to do. You define the, the canonical part function, which is just an and or tree. You know, it's an and or tree of depth d and, and, and the tropic of planning. And well, let's not get this a little bit too much parameters here. Uh, so, and then you just use the projections I said in a much sort of in a, in a hierarchical way. So after I rounds of restrictions, in some subtrees all variables will be constants and producing a constant value, or all variables in that subtree will be either set to constants or identified with a single new variable. And this single new variable will actually be the output of this circuit. And now you just have to do this in a clever enough way uh, that you know you preserve this of uh, getting a uniform input, and this you get by the suitable combination of identifications and fixings, and you just want to be able to prove a switching lemma in this sort of. And this is gets just very technical, but this is just trying to convey the idea of how, how you how you define these restrictions. And um, the lessons to learn here is that we do have an average case result, and the other thing is that there are very interesting processes of picking a uniformly random input. It's not enough to pick, you know, ran independently random input, but we, we, you know, having this idea of saying that all these bits are equal, but I won't tell you what the values are, and the other ones will sort of be, be random in sort of a very, very powerful way. I don't know if I got you in this one. Great, so that's all I wanted to tell you about the hierarchy result. Now I, I want to tell you even more of the recent results and where an even more complicated switching lemma. And this is going to happen is in, in, uh, in proof complexity. And I'm, first, I'm, I don't know how many of you are well conversed in proof complexity, so I'll, I'll give you a crash course in proof complexity. What? The complexity of proofs. We're giving something, how long is the proof? That's the basic question. I'm an amateur in this, so you don't ask me too difficult questions, but I know the basics. Uh, so, and then you sort of ask, you know, what kind of formulas are allowing this proof? You know, what do we want the world to prove? So, um, let's do the most famous and simple proof system, and that's resolution. I, I don't know how familiar you, how many people know what resolution is? Oh, almost everybody. So you, you have a clause A and A or X and B and a, a complement and you derive this clause. This is easy. And then of course you need some favorite contradictions to play with. And the favorite contradiction is the pigeonhole principle that tells you you have n plus 1 pigeons flying into n holes. And something that I'll return to which is the Satan parity principle for graphs. But let me start by telling you a little bit about the pigeonhole principle. So let's, this is the pigeonhole principle of three pigeons flying into two holes. Xij is true if pigeon i flies into hole j. So the first three axioms tells you that pigeon one flies somewhere, pigeon two flies somewhere, and pigeon three flies somewhere. Okay. Are you happy with this? The second line says that there's not two pigeons flying into hole one. Because it says you know either pigeon one doesn't fly there or two not there, 
or the other three. And the third thing says that, you know, the same thing for hold two. And now even for this simple thing, you know, the, the resolution proof is sort of, you now start deriving things. But there isn't so much you can do, so you take these two, you know, the pigeon one flying somewhere, and not two things flying into hole two, and you derive a clause by doing the elimination on X11. And then you'll get the clause of size two. And then you say, well, that's a new as nice no axiom. We have X21, and then you look for X21 <coughs> in the other form, and you resolve by this, and you suddenly get some new axiom, er, some new clause. And you do this for a while, and you get, for this thing you get shorter and shorter clauses, and then eventually, in seven steps, you can get that both these have to be true, and this in fact contradicts, let's see. Uh, did I get this right? Yeah, this says that eventually you get that pigeon 1 flies into hole 2 and pigeon 2 flies into two, hole 2 and this contradicts <laughs> axiom 7. And even doing this on three pigeons and two holes, you know, it takes you uh, some minutes to come up with the proof. There's very little intuition here, at least I'm not so. And in fact, classical result in, 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 um, in uh, so uh, in the proof complexity, this, the pigeon hole principle requires exponential size proof if uh, in resolution. This was proved already in the mid 80s. Uh, so we're going to spend a little bit more time on the Satan. So let me tell you what Satan is, and here we have a graph of five nodes, <coughs> and we have a variable for each uh, edge. And then we have the clauses which I didn't write down, which in fact are parity constraints, saying that if you sum the parities next to one node, it's the, the sum is odd. Okay. Uh, and this, so this is really a mod to sum condition. And this is a contradiction, because if you sum that all over the graph, each variable gets summed twice, and you have an odd number of one, so you get a one. And the question is how what um, how hard is this to prove? And of course sometimes it's easy to prove. But the one already it's taken in this 68 said that it's taken, I didn't call it the second principle. Uh, said that it requires what I now call a sub-exponential number of steps in what's called regular resolution. This was really before the proof complexity existed, but then our court in fact removed regular, so I won't tell you what this is, but for full resolution and get gave exponential lower bounds. Yeah. So it seems like you know for our two favorite principles we're done here, but we should follow the general paradigm, you know, if something is done, we want to do it for, for more powerful proof systems. And the question, how do we make our solution more powerful? Well, we give it, you know, we change the rules of the game so we can sort of make the proof system work with more powerful formulas or give it better reasoning rules. And in fact, the important thing is here to get the, the, the system more formulas to reason with because the reasoning rules are sort of can't change so much once they're local and sound. There's not so much you can do because you can only derive true consequences of, of what you have. And what are we going to do? Well, uh, sorry. So the focus today is, of course, now we're going to allow the reasoning rules to be depth D circuits. Because small depth circuits, that's what we, we, we're so, so good at. So we'll have you know, a, a reasoning system with, with depth D circuits, and the rules, I won't even tell you what the rules are, but there are simple things that if you know P, and we know that P implies Q, we can derive Q. And then some other natural things that and If we know A or B, this is the same as B or A, and some simple rules that are clearly some. Uh, so I'm not even really working this, but you know, somehow, the name of the game here is not to come up with very nice proofs of simple things, but in fact prove that this doesn't buy you so much. Don't quote me. Well, I'm, I'm being filmed. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so we won't, 
<laughs> we want to prove lower bounds, you know. Of course, if this had been enormously powerful and we could have proved everything we wanted to prove in depth too, this would have been nice. But experience says that for natural things, if we can't do them in resolution, it's usually hard to do them in depth too or depth three. And this sort of program was started almost immediately. So this was once we have this lower bounds for, for computing with small depth circuits, the, the people started looking at, at um, um, proofs with containing small depth circuits. And for the pigeonhole principle, uh, ITI, also a very difficult to read paper, managed to prove non constant bound. And Balantoni and Pitassi and Urquhart proved that this non constant was at least log star which is the number of law, time chapter applied laws, <coughs> get below three. And Krajicek and, and, and Pitasetal independently got this up to log log n. And in fact, Pittenwood principle is easy once you can count and bus prove that, you know, if you give you depth log n, you can count and then you can prove the Pittenwood principle because it's sort of an easy principle of double counting. And, and for the same thing, this log log n was the same, uh, was also obtained, and then more recently, the, the same people that did the average case complexity enlarged with Tony Pitassi was uh, able to push this load bound to square root log. And in fact, the funny thing about this paper is that while other sort of had the end to some exponentially decreasing power of, of, of <laughs> exponential n to a decreasing exponentially decreasing number in t, they proved this very weird thing which was barely super polynomial but remained super polynomial so for, for larger values of z. Uh, so what we're gonna do is that we're gonna move from very complicated graph like expander graphs and and um, and complete graphs in fact to the grid, or in fact the torus. And of course, we're going to have you know astronomically many pieces of the um, large grids to prove anything. But this is just to give you a slight feeling. This is the grid of side length 75. And the thing that I managed to prove is that for those who get lower bounds that actually match the uh, the circuit lower bounds, so you get something that exponential in one over something to the t. And I, I happen to get a strange constant 58. Uh, and this proved that you need, you know, the, the log n depth. But the main thing I want to tell you about, how do you prove these things? And of course, the way you prove these things, since it's, we're in this talk, you prove them by switching them. Okay. So, how does this switching lemma come in here? Well, we'll have some proof with all these containing all these formulas of small depth, and we're going to fix most of the variables to the inputs. And we're going to achieve two things. We're going to reduce the contradiction to a similar contradiction on a smaller size, but we'll use the switching lemma to reduce the depth of all circuits in this proof by one. You know, we already show you how switching lemma sort of decreases the depth of, of circuits, and many circuits at the same time by one. And when we've done this enough times, the proof, and I didn't really show you the last, and once something is of depth 2, another switch, it actually makes this only depend on a constant number of variables. So it's a really stupid thing. So what this says is, with enough, setting enough variables, we in fact reduce the proof for each formula, and the proof only depends on a constant number of variables, and that can't be a correct proof. And that was sort of well, Can't you stop at, the, at level 2? Well, then you need to prove a resolution lower bound or something. But once you have the switching lemma machinery set up, you know, you can sort of, if we're not getting the correct constants here anyhow. So, you know, if you, if you add one more level, then it's sort of, you don't need the best case. But I agree. Yeah. So now you're sort of, I was getting all these crazy bounds. So all these papers were sort of proved by switching lemma techniques. And what's the sort of the, the main parameter of the switching lemma? It's sort of the failure probability, which is a, I had as a failure probability of PT and S before, you know. The probability, this, the size that remains, 
the input value and the output value. And in fact, here, sometimes it also depends on the number of variables that you have at your disposal. And RP, which is one of the simplest and the best and the easiest restrictions, they're so independent, they're so good, and this, as I had on the previous slide, is 5 pt to the power s. And these guys, you know, some of these papers were getting things which sort of looked right, where it's getting a p to the 4, which was, but I also have a constant here. But the bad thing is they were getting dependence on n. And this is for the pigeonhole principle of switches. The, the, the potassium tunnel is sort of able to get rid of this n, but sort of managed to get this, uh, forced to get a factor of 2 to the t into this thing. What I was sort of able to replace is 2 to the t by an s to the 54. And this is sort of what, what gave the improvement. And uh, I'm not sure I'm going to tell you too, too much about the, the only thing I can say, why do this show up in the, in the pigeonhole principle? Well, in the pigeonhole principle, for the natural things of setting some of the variables, you don't want the, the xijs to be 0, 1 with equal probability. Because a variable being 1 says the pigeon i definitely flies into whole j. And if you do that with, half, with probability 1 half, you'll get so many pigeons flying into a hole that it's sort of you immediately get to the point. So you really want this to happen with probability 1 over n, and then this 1 over n comes into haunt you in the proof. This other comment is so technical, so maybe I'll skip it. So, what, allowed, what you now need to do is you need to find a very complicated or a, a good way to improve preserved state tautologies, setting variables, which is where it's possible to prove a switching lock. This is the name of the game, and here's why I come in. You know, the proof complexity is not, but this is not. Defining restrictions and proving switching lemma <coughs> is what I like. So I'll tell you a little bit about how these restrictions work, just to give you a sense for what you can do with switching levels. And I'll use these restrictions that were used before, that you know, I'd not only set to constants, but in fact, I'll identify several, several old variables. And now I won't always set them to the same, but I'll also negate the results. So let's show you how this works in a... Um, So before I had this graph, you know, which was Satan on, on five, five nodes, and I'm going to show you a way how to reduce this to Satan on three nodes. And I'm going to keep two, three, and five. And that says that we should have three new variables, y2, three, y2, five, and y3, five. Which will sort of, and now this won't be any more on single vertices, but I'll, I'll have a path from two to five that's sort of labeled by, by these variables. And now I do this in such a clever way, but you also see I sort of randomly, seemingly randomly put some negations here. But if you look at this node that we sort of want to eliminate, before we wanted an odd number of ones next to this guy. And I'm claiming this is always going to be satisfied independently of the value of y25, even if I don't tell you what it is. Because we have one, one there, and if y25 is true, we'll have zero of these, and otherwise we'll have two. And similarly here at y23, at this eliminating node, independent of the size of y23, it's going to be always satisfied. Because I have a zero there and two things there. So this means you can take a graph and sort of just start taking paths, and on these paths you'll sort of identify all variables, and you'll have suitable negations, and things are in a fairly good way. Uh, so then it's sort of easy. then you sort of obviously have the high level picture, you're gonna take, you know we're gonna maybe I'll just do it immediately. You have your your enormous grid. So what you're gonna take is you're gonna take big sub grids of these. And you'll pick one vertex in each of these. You'll connect these by paths, 
And on each of these paths, you're going to have you know, one variable which will appear positively and negatively in a good pattern to make sure that everything on the path is um, satisfied. Uh, and if you look carefully here and you're still awake, you can see that I cheated you. I needed this path also. But now if you look, if you want to connect this guy to this guy, which should really be to make a new grid, I can't do it anymore because I screwed up, right? Yeah. And you don't want sort of these paths to intersect because then you need two variables sitting on the same edge and this is not going to work. So it turns out that you can't really do this. Uh, <coughs> and there are many complications. You can't prove a switching lemma in this situation. You know, picking exactly one lonely subscript with horrible correlations. We need much more clever way to pick the paths. And I'll give you a feeling for what's going on. We in fact not pick the new centers arbitrarily. We sort of have some possible centers. We connect these by almost jo this joint path. We sort of have a first level of s completely uniformly s sampled centers, and then we're going to eliminate almost all. So let me do this in pictures. So we'll have a central area, and these black points will be the only one that sort of comes into possible play. These are the only centers we'll ever pick. Each of these, we can't really choose nice paths, but we'll need to choose paths with five pieces. And we'll make sure that these are sort of almost disjoint by cleverly constructing them. And then what we'll do is, when we pick an overall restriction, we'll pick first a, a, a subset of these centers, which is sort of be done very uniformly and randomly. And we sort of, by the law of large numbers, have at least some surviving centers in each subsquares. We'll eliminate some by some deterministic process. We'll use the remaining centers. We'll hook them up with these paths that we predetermined. And there's a very many details here. But amazingly, you can still prove a switching level. And sort of because of these many sort of annoying details, you get, for instance, this constant. And uh, so what I want to end with by saying is that, you know, it's amazing when you first encounter restrictions, you know, this is such a simple procedure. You fix some values to some, some variables. It has really been possible to prove an amazing number of, of results. And results come out of this in various, various areas still. But we want more methods. So I talked about restrictions and switching lemmas, which is possibly produced the most. There's also this polynomial method by Rasboro, which has not yet found its use in proof complexity because it doesn't mix so well with the proof complexity part. So we would want to have something more of these two methods, and in particular, we would like to prove a better lower bounds than we can get by either of these methods. And it turns out that both these methods end at this list, n to the 1 over d minus 1. And already for d equal to 3, we don't know how to do something better. So we can't prove a lower bound that's better than 2 to the square root of 10 for depth 3 circuits. We need something completely new. We, we can't understand even depth 3 circuits. And, uh, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs>